So with that, uh, we'll get started. I'll, I'll just uh, start from the very first question in the set and I'll just uh, flip through all the questions. If it's calculation question, I will skip because I've done it in the other video. And some of the multiple choice questions I will also likely skip because they often cover things that you can easily get from reading the textbook and also it's you know multiple choice. There's only one right answer. Okay, so this very first question is um, asking me to evaluate um, whether each of these statements are true. So let's go through all of them to see if there's any uh, common misconception that I can highlight. Um, and as always, you know, look at the hint, <laughs> even if it very often just tells you to read the section, it at least it links you to the correct section. So. Um, so it says, so I'll just go through each statement one at a time. Um, electric charges push and pull each other with a long range of force. Um, yeah, that is true. And uh, in physics, there's a very specific sense in which we mean long range when we say long range. Um, you can kind of think of the distinction between a contact force and uh, forces that do not require contact. So a uh, contact force would be the shortest of short range forces. And when we say long range, um, this is the phrase that I want you to get comfortable used to seeing, uh, which is the phrase that you actually have seen before in the context of with the gravity, uh, the inverse square law forces. And what that is referring to is where the force is proportional to one over distance squared, you know, inverse square. And um, it turns out this is the most common way a long range force um, manifests itself. You saw that in the case of gravity and you are going to see that in the case of electricity and later magnetism. Um, and uh, when we get to I guess we don't spend a lot of time in it, but when you get to like learning about nuclear forces, nuclear forces are short range forces and they diminish much more quickly than inverse square law would. would. So, so in the sense, um, electric forces are long range forces. Uh, electric charges of opposite sign repel and like same sign attract. Okay, that seems like the opposite, the other way to me. So that's not correct. So I'm not gonna, uh, in fact, okay, it's this version that it's this version that's actually correct. You might have heard the phrase, you know, opposites attract and likes repel. And uh, that statement at least up, as applied to the interaction between electric charges is 100% correct. Um, a positive charge attracts a negative charge and a positive charge repels another positive charge. Uh, it's also expressed in Coulomb's law. Uh, electric charges repel each other when they come in contact with each other. Yeah, that has nothing to do with anything. This is just a nonsense sentence. <laughs> One, because it's a long range force. So whether they are in contact or not has nothing to do with each other. And whether they repel, repel each other or not has to do with uh, the sign. Um, and <laughs> I see the comment. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, see, there are languages that we use in physics that, um, that are rather technical and specific, unexpectedly so, and long range is an, such an example. Force between electric charges are neutralized at long distances. Yeah, I think both of these and these are um, places where I've basically made up some nonsense sentence that actually doesn't mean anything, but it sounds like it's saying something. It doesn't, it, like what does neutralized even mean? <laughs> That's not a word that you would, um, not in the context of forces. You can talk about neutralizing a net charge on, a, on an object, but uh, I, I think the technical term for this is word salad, which is a kind of stringing together of words that sound like they make sense. But when you actually know something about the subject, you can see that it, 
doesn't make any sense. And that's kind of my favorite way of uh, coming up with incorrect choices. So that's what you see there. <laughs> Let me keep going. Um, question two. Yeah, so this is one of those uh, multiple choice questions. So I will leave that for you. <laughs> and uh, I am kind of uh, trying to confuse you here with the different uses of the word conserved or conservation. Um, like conservative force is actually a thing. And in fact, electric forces are conservative forces. But um, in the sense that uh, you can associate a potential energy with the electric force. But that has nothing to do with the charge conservation. So, um, so you can go through that and figure out which uh, sense of conservation this. So, um, yeah, this is what I was getting at with the, uh, the long range and inverse square law. So let me just uh, read through the choices to see if there's something I should highlight. And if not, I'll move on to the next question. Um, yeah, I, I think you can, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, fine. Um, as in you can get at the answer and it, it, I don't think I'm getting at any deep conceptual thing here. So let me move on to the next question. And this is a calculation question. I've done uh, something that looks exactly like this in the recorded video that you see. It links from course modules. And this is, uh, I think even though this is a multiple choice question, it, uh, I think worth answering. So let me actually answer this one because it, um, yeah, although there it's quite a bit of a long hint and that actually the hint does give you most of what you need, but let me just walk you through this uh, consideration. So if you, um, so if, so I, I'm going to imagine placing a charge somewhere for the sake of concreteness. I'm going to imagine placing a positive charge maybe here. Then I can think about what kind of force would this positive charge feel from this other positive charge and from this negative charge. The positive charge repels. So the plus to micro Coulomb charge will push this positive charge that way. And this minus one micro Coulomb charge, it'll attract. So it'll actually pull in the same direction. And this is where it, when you are looking for, um, could the net electric force on the third charge be zero? You can kind of get a lot from just the direction of these arrows. Uh, if both the positive and the negative charge are trying to push and pull this to the right, then okay, there those two forces are never gonna add up to zero. So, and th this these directions will be right for uh, wherever I place this positive charge within the region B. So within that region, there's no place where I can place this positive charge so that it it feels a zero net force. So, okay, I gotta move that positive charge. Let me move it. Um, let me imagine moving it here. So if this charge in region is in region A, then okay, the plus two micro coulomb will push it away to the left. And this minus one micro coulomb will pull it um, towards itself, it will attract, so it will pull it to the right. And um, then, you know, you might think, oh, so it, the answer must be A. Now, and then if you submit it, you will see that the answer is wrong. And, um, and so let's, uh, let me consider placing this charge somewhere in region C and try to see what the difference there is. Can I do copy and paste? I can't do copy and paste, okay. So let me just redraw the positive charge. So let me imagine placing a positive charge within region C. Then, okay, let's just work through the forces again. 
plus two micro coulomb, it'll push this positive charge away towards right. This minus one micro coulomb um, negative charge, it'll pull it towards itself. So it'll pull it to the left. So in terms of the direction of forces, you can see that between region A and C, there isn't much of a difference. Both of these forces, they point in opposite directions. So there's a possibility of these two forces somehow adding up to zero. So I need to come up with a way to rule out how for at least one of those two regions, um, how it is impossible for these forces to add up to zero. And I kind of indicated it a little bit uh, with these arrows I'm drawing because I kind of know what the answer will be, spoilers. <laughs> um, so this is where you have to start thinking a little bit quantitatively. You have to start think, you have to think in terms of the expression for the electric force. So the expression for electric force is that, well, it's proportional to the product of the charges and it's inversely proportional to the distance. So the charges that are larger will exert greater force. The, we do this inverse square, that means charges that are closer will also exert a greater force than otherwise. So when you are looking at this charge here, this uh, repelling force that's coming from plus two microcoulomb charge, it's coming from a charge that is both larger and closer. So everything you have in this um, interaction says that this force has to be greater than the force from this smaller charge that's also farther away. That's why these two forces will never add up to zero because the force that's pushing the charge to the left is always gonna be larger. But when you look at the charge in the region C, that's where you can see the attractive force from micro, minus one micro coulomb. It's, um, so, so, you know, it's closer to the charge. So that'll tend to make it large, make the force larger. And even though the force from the plus to micro coulomb will be larger because of this larger amount of charge, the charge is farther away. So you can imagine there being one particular place, somewhere in region C, where you can balance those two factors so that the amount by which this minus one micro coulomb is closer by is exactly balances out how much bigger this force is because the charge here is greater. So, so that's where you can see, oh, if I place a charge somewhere, not everywhere, but somewhere in region C at the exact right location, then I can have net force add up to zero. Now, because there's this uh, choice that says, you need to know the sign of the third charge. Let me imagine replacing this charge, a positive charge, what I assumed was positive, with a negative charge. What if this had been a negative charge? Well, then the force from the plus to micro coulomb, it'll help in an attractive force. So, oh, wait, this, so let me just label things so that I don't confuse myself here. So this was the force from plus to micro coulomb. This was the force from minus one micro coulomb. So, um, so when I place a charge here, force from plus to micro coulomb will be attractive. So it'll point to the left and the force from minus one micro coulomb will be repulsive. So it'll point to the right. So yeah, if you're just looking at force from individual charges, yeah, their direction is different. But uh, note this, these two forces will be have the same magnitude magnitudes because the only thing that's different different between them is the directions sign and the same deal for these two. So if uh, this positive charge was placed at a place where these two forces balanced out, then these two forces will balance out again. So it actually, in terms of where there will be zero net force on this 
third charge, it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. Either way, the the forces will add up to zero. So, so that's why the hint for this question is so low, because I'm kind of trying to explain. Um, so this is uh, one of the reading questions that's getting at an important concept that we call electric field, um, and um, and I, I guess uh, the I'll just start out with this. The defining expression for electric field is this. Electric field is always directly related to electric force. And the way they are related is electric force is given by electric field at the location of a, a charge of charge Q. So you need to know the amount of the charge that's at the that location where you know the electric field somehow, and the charge times the electric field uh, gives you the force. And these are technically back vector quantities that ha has a sense of direction. So that's the defining expression for electric field. Um, it relates directly to electric force. So let's go through each of the choices to see if they're right or not. All charges placed within an electric field are pushed in the direction of the electric field. That sounds tempting and it's not correct because it has to do with what is the sign of the charge Q. If the charge Q is positive, then sure, electric field and force, they point in the same direction. But if a charge is negative, then these two point in opposite directions. So the first choice is incorrect. Electric field is an illustration of force exerted by a point charge on its surrounding charges. Um, no, uh, for one, because it's not an illustration of force. <laughs> and, and, um, and this charge, it's more of a hypothetical test charge. Like it, th there doesn't actually have to be a charge there to illustrate the electric field there. So this sentence is not correct. Electric field is defined in terms of force on a test charge of charge Q. And yeah, this is the exact um, defining expression minus the you know vector notation, which we don't emphasize here. Um, but just you know, have in the back of your mind that force is vector quantity. So that kind of makes the electric field has to be vector. Um, electric field points in the direction of force yeah. <laughs> on a positive test charge, yeah. If a Q is positive, then these two do, do point in the same direction. Electric field is proportional to the magnitude of the force on the test charge. All right, yeah, I guess these two expressions look proportional. You know, if I imagine uh, doubling, somehow things coming up in such a way that the amount of force is doubled, and I'm gonna keep the charge of the test charge the same. That's not gonna change. And it's the electric field that has to double and that's what proportional means. So, get me scanning the chat for any questions and not seeing any, let me move on. Question seven. Oh, this is a calculation question that I have done before. You have a recording of that, um, so I'm not gonna do it again. <laughs> Let me move on to the next question, which I also want to because it's a calculation question that you already have a recording of me doing. Uh, okay. Um, so this is where I kind of have to assume that you have read section 10.4 and you have seen field lines. So um, so I want to do the whole introduction of what field lines are. I'll just uh, draw some examples and counter examples as necessary to answer this question here. So, so it says, you know, choose the statements that correctly describe uh, features of uh, field lines that are correctly drawn. So it says the direction of field line is parallel to the velocity of charge of the particle moving in the field. Ah, so this is where you have to be careful about distinguishing between, distinguishing the relationship between velocity, acceleration, and force. So, you know, when you have a velocity, 
you know it's not the same thing as acceleration. They are not the same. And it's the acceleration that's going to be related directly to the force. Acceleration is given by the net force divided by mass. So uh, when we have this relationship between force and electric field lines, that uh, electric force is given by charge times the electric field. When you have this, what this relationship is telling you is that uh, the acceleration of charge the particle is going to be in the direction of force, which is in the direction of electric field. But just the acceleration, not velocity. There are situations where if you start out the charge from rest, then you can make it so that velocity ends up in the same direction as acceleration, but it's not in general true. So that's not correct, I won't select it. The direction of field line is tangent to the trajectory of charge of the particles moving in the field. Oh yeah, and if you read this carefully, the first two choices are saying basically the same thing and they're both basically wrong. So that's not right. The field lines begin on positive charges and end on negative charges. Oh yeah, that's correct. Um, one kind of most common example where you see that is the dipole field lines. So with the dipole charge distribution, you have a positive and a negative charges and the field lines look something like this. So, and what these field lines are meant to represent is the fact that Positive, so I, it's easiest to figure out the direction of the electric field lines if you imagine placing a positive test charge somewhere. So uh, what these directions are illustrating is that if I were to place a positive test charge here, it'll get repelled from the positive charge and it'll get attracted to the negative charge. So it'll kind of move in this general direction and that matches the direction of the electric field lines. So since uh, the positive test charge will be pushed away from the positive charge, that's why they, the lines begin on positive charge and they go towards the negative charge because that's where the positive charges will be attracted to. Okay, I see a question, uh, more of the trick language. We call three and four from the text. Um, well, maybe verbatim, I, I can go. So um, first and second, they are, um, they are more of a reference to uh, like your knowledge of kinematics. So, um, you know, physics is a cumulative subject <laughs> because we are in unit three doesn't mean you can't, for you can't forget unit one. You still should remember unit one. So yeah, you wouldn't expect to maybe see this directly in the textbook, but you should remember enough of unit one to figure this out. And oh yeah, for the field lines, it must never cross each other. That is directly in the textbook. And it's a really a simple illustration or simple statement of the fact that, you know, imagine you had a place where field lines did actually cross. And if there had, is a charge here, well, um, there must be a net single net force on the charge, a single direction in which the charge will be pushed. And if there's an actual crossing here, then it, it, the force net force is not well defined. So um, is it that way? Is it this way? Um, so now there are situations where it could almost look like the field lines will cross. But in those cases, it might end up something like, I don't know. Um, that particular one is a little bit hard. It might end up with something like this, where field lines almost cross, but they don't. Um, so that's a more of a just a statement of mathematical consistency. Um, the field lines must be uniformly spaced for a physically realistic field. Um, so that's another example of that word salad again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the reason I'm calling it word solid is actually there's a counter example right here. So when you look at this dipole field distribution, it should, uh, the field lines should look a little bit denser um, in this region because uh, the, you know there are more field lines between these two and out here it's uh, uh, not as quite as dense and it's also denser right around the charge. So they are clearly not uniformly spaced. 
Uh, oh, and I guess uh, I see what you mean by you only remember things three and yeah, it's because those are the correct choices. And sometimes, uh, I guess more often than not, the wrong choices would be the ones that um, you wouldn't see in the textbook because textbook usually tries to tell you the correct things. We don't spend a lot of thing, time on things that are wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, it doesn't always, always mean that something that's not in the textbook verbatim means that it's necessarily wrong. Doesn't mean that, but yeah, more often than not, if it's not in some way or form in the textbook, then yeah, it's probably not in the textbook because it's wrong. <laughs> so, um, so with this question, I will just, uh, highlight the two different expressions for voltage and how that, uh, what kind of story each of those expressions are telling. So I guess when we try to introduce the concept of voltage conceptually, this is the expression that we often rely on. And what this is saying is that is in English language, uh, potential energy is equal to charge times uh, voltage or electric potential. And I hope some form of this looks rather familiar because we've been talking about electric field before and with the electric field, it was defined through the relationship involving electric force is equal to the amount of test charge times the electric field. And um, these two relationships are meant to appear parallel, as in electric field was the quantity that most directly related to electric force. And the concept of field was introduced so that you can kind of factor out the amount of charge um, so that so, you know, whenever you are talking about electric force, you have to know how much charge is there. But when you are talking about electric field, um, you don't necessarily need to explicitly mention the amount of charge. And that's the same thing we are trying to do with this expression. So you could say electric potential or voltage is the amount of potential energy per charge, so that you don't have to worry about how much charge is there um, that stores that amount of energy. So that's uh, the story that's being told through this expression. And, um, and this is kind of closing the loop. Um, if you remember our discussion about um, potential energy, potential energy was defined in terms of work done by conservative force specifically was minus of the work done by conservative force. Because when conservative force does negative work that stores energy somewhere that you can get back out into form of kinetic energy and whatnot. And the work done by conservative force would be, let me just keep the minus sign, that would be whatever that conservative force is times displacement. That's the definition of work. So keeping all this in mind, if you, um, if you look at this relationship here, I hope you can see that um, there's a way to express things on the right-hand side in terms of electric field. And by using this expression, you can get charge involved in the expression for the left-hand side. And when you go through the algebra, you can see that the charges will cancel out. So, so you know, all that algebra isn't required, but just to write it down, so charge times the electric potential or change in electric potential is equal to minus. So writing in expression for electric force instead, that's charge times electric field, that product with the displacement. And so this expression is kind of closing that loop. And um, 
making it unnecessary to uh, bring in the, this test charge when we are talking about electric potential energy, or sorry, electric potential or voltage. Um, we can describe electric potential purely in terms of electric field without ever bringing in the test charge. And, um, and technically this is uh, how I would usually define change of electric potential because we, we want to think of electric field as the fundamental quantity. So this uh, allows you to define electric potential in terms of that fundamental quantity. Whereas, you know, this test charge Q, it's an arbitrary thing that we are always hoping will cancel out in relevant context. So, yeah, I guess that's actually all the answers. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, one thing that I want people to get used to or start thinking in terms of is that all the equations in or formulas in physics, they tell a story. There's a narrative associated with each of these expressions and that's what I want you to focus your time on uh, and time and effort understanding things. Um, the, the, it's not required that you memorize the formulas in this class, but it is hoped and expected that you will understand the conceptual things that's addressed in those formulas and expressions. So, okay, uh, I think this is the very last question. So let's get to it. Oh, wow, this is taking a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, why? <laughs> Okay, um, so electron volt is one of the commonly used non-SI unit. Choose all statements below which correctly explain why and the circumstance in which electron volt is more convenient than the SI unit of Joule. And yeah, uh, um, so as a reminder, what an electron volt is, it's a, a unit defined by what it kind of looks like. It looks like electron times a volt. And um, it, it and so it's actually written as so one EV. And if you think of this EV as like E times V, that actually ends up being right-ish. And what one E means in this context is one electron charge. Uh, one elementary charge, charge of an electron. And I guess V is just the one volt. Um, and the elementary charge, it's very small number of columns. I think it's about uh, 1.6 something times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. And uh, volt is a volt. And Coulomb times a volt uh, gives you joule. So one electron volt is a really small amount of energy. That's about 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 joule. So in, so, so, so <laughs> that's one thing to know. And le let's uh, just to go through the remainder of the choices to see if uh, um, um, it's, uh, <laughs> um, to see what's what. So the first, uh, oh yeah, this is constructed in a way uh, that I like constructing wrong choices. I like telling half truths in um, in wrong choices. Uh, so electron volt is what one would characterize as a natural unit system, because I'm using the natural elementary charge as part of my unit system. But you know, as the question itself kind of hints at it, it's not more convenient than Joule in all circumstances. Um, if you are working with like a, uh, if you are working with the mechanical things, you know, lifting a kilogram mass by one meter, then electron volt would be ridiculous unit to use to describe that interaction. Um, so, so that's not correct. If it's half wrong, then it's all wrong. Um, electron volt is more convenient than joule when other quantities such as velocity must be calculated from energy. Doesn't make immediate sense to me, so I'm gonna skip it, assuming that it's wrong. Um, and so, so let me skip it for now. Electron volt is convenient in describing interactions involving subatomic particles which carry charges in multiples of elementary charge. E. Um, yeah, that is definitely the case. And in fact, that's kind of built into the unit here 
So if I ask you, how much does the energy of an electron change as it goes through one volt of electric potential? If you're trying to figure out it in, in um, the SI unit, you have to look up how much charge is on an electron charge. So it you know, takes multiple steps. But if you are looking for the answer in electron volt units, well, it changes by energy of one EV because amount of change of voltage was one volt. Um, so it becomes very convenient in those circumstances. When you know your particles have charge of an elementary charge E yeah, or some multiples of that. Electron volt is convenient in describing microscopic phenomena where the quantity of one joule is, yeah. That's uh, uh, typically the case, like atomic energy levels, as you will see in unit four, um, are very naturally described in units of electron volt. Um, electron volt is more convenient than joule. Yeah, yeah. Macroscopic charged objects will often have large amount of charges, like a microcoulomb is a fairly large amount of charge compared to this. And in those cases, electron volt won't be convenient. And uh, this choice that I skipped because it sounded like a nonsense. Um, yeah, I think it's still nonsense. I'm going to leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so electron volt is the unit that you will see more often as we get into quantum mechanics in unit four. And quantum mechanics, as you will see when we get to unit four, is the uh, science of microscopic things. So yeah, it's right. Macro is a dead giveaway. <laughs>